Welcome to Python Basics, Building Systems with Classes. To get the most out of this course, ideally, you'll already have some notion of what object-oriented programming in Python looks like. You'll be taking a closer look at the question of how do you actually use classes when coding? And in this course, you're going to see that you can compose classes together, inherit and override behavior from other classes, and you can mix and match these approaches. This isn't an exhaustive course. This is just an introduction to building systems with classes so you can have an idea about how classes can be worked together into more complex systems. This course is part of a series, Python Basics. All the courses in this series use IDLE, the integrated development and learning environment that comes bundled with Python. If you're not sure what IDLE is, check out a previous course in the Python Basics series called Setting Up Python, or check out Starting with Python IDLE on realpython.com. So with that, let's get stuck into building systems with classes. How do you combine classes together into systems? The first way you're going to look at is with composition. Take a look at this class. It's a point class that represents a point in two-dimensional space using the Cartesian coordinate system. You have your class definition, you have your constructor method, and you are assigning some attributes in the constructor, your x and y position in space. A class like this can make information easier to handle. It allows you to reference the values with labels like x and y, and can be better than having the x and y coordinates in a list, for instance, where there is no immediate indication as to what they represent. A way you might use this in composition is if you were building shapes. Take this shape class, for instance. In the constructor method, you're setting an attribute called points. And in that, you're setting the points that were passed in in the constructor. You can imagine that the argument would be passed in as a list. So then, as an attribute of the shape instance, you'd have points, which would be a list of points. So within this class, its attribute is a list of instances of a different class. Each class is independent, but one class relies on the other class for its attributes. This is an example of composition. Loading up these two classes in idle, I've got my editor on the right-hand side and the shell on the left-hand side. You can see the point class and the shape class. So the way that this might work is that, say, you want to define a triangle. And this will be a shape. This expression calls the shape constructor. And the shape constructor needs a points argument. And since this is going to be various points, you're going to make that a list. We're going to split this up onto various lines so that it looks neater. And each item in the list will be a point. Let's start off with a point at the origin. And then we'll have another point at, say, 5 across, 5 up. And then we'll have another point, say, at 2 across, 4 up. So here, everything's happening in this one expression. You're instantiating a shape, and the shape constructor needs one argument, which is the points. We're starting a list, and then within that list, each element of that list is an instantiation of a point instance. We can run this. We'll first save with Control S and then F5. And that ran without any errors. So now if we can look at triangle, you can see that that's a shape object. And if you look at the triangle dot points, you can see that you have a list and one point object two point objects, and three point objects. And that is an example of composition. You're using one class as a way to build the attributes of other classes. This doesn't have to be limited to one class being an attribute of another class that takes it in. 
you can have many low level classes that stand quite independently. And then you can have one or more classes that group them together into higher level classes. As the name suggests, composition is something of a creative activity. It's up to you how you want to compose things together and where you draw the boundaries between different concepts, models, and ideas. So as you've seen, you can define many different variables. Here's another way of looking at the same sort of process. Here you've got a bunch of variables that define points. So you have a bottom left variable, bottom right variable, top left variable, top right variable. And these represent different points. They outline a square because point bottom left is at zero, zero. Point bottom right is at 10 across, zero up. Top left, zero across, 10 up. And top right is at 10, 10. So that would kind of outline a square. Then you can instantiate a new shape object and then pass in, in a list, the four variables that you just defined. Then you'll see that square is a shape, is an instantiated shape. And the points attribute of the square contain four instances of the point class. And that's composition, an extremely powerful and creative way to combine classes together to form more complex systems. Another way to create relationships between classes is to use a mechanism called inheritance. Inheritance can be a tricky concept to wrap your head around or understand when it might be useful in a real-life situation. That said, it is a handy tool, maybe not as common as composition, but it's still handy. For instance, inheritance can be really helpful in creating variations in classes. Imagine that you have a large class with many methods, and then it turns out you need another class, just a small variation on that class. It only differs in one single method. Do you write the whole class again with just one different method? No. You can use inheritance to do that very cleanly. Inheritance also happens to be a favorite source of OOP interview questions, so it's well worth being exposed to it. For the example, you're going to be working with this doggo class, which represents a dog. This doggo class has a class attribute, a constructor method, a special instance method, or a dunder method, and a normal method. This is how you instantiate various instances of doggos with this current class structure. Then you can choose any of these doggos and get them to speak, and they all behave in exactly the same way. That's to be expected. But maybe you want to define different breeds of doggo, and you want that to be obvious from the class name. Well, inheritance gives you a way to do that. Take a look at these class definitions. They rely on the existing definition of the doggo class, as you can see here. These are subclasses of the doggo class. The way you define a subclass is you take the class keyword, as you do with normal classes. You have the name, again, as you do with normal classes. But instead of going straight to the colon, you add in some brackets, as if it were a function. Just a quick note on terminology here. When I say brackets, I mean round brackets or parentheses. If we come across square, curly, or angled brackets, I'll explicitly say so. But if I just say brackets, I'm referring to round brackets or parentheses. And you add in the parent class here. So this allows you to subclass Doggo into various different classes. So we've got Drag Russell Terrier here, Dashund, Bulldog. Now these names will come up whenever you instantiate an instance from these classes. Note that we're just leaving these empty for now. The default behavior of this will be that since it's subclassing Doggo, these classes are going to behave exactly the same as the Doggo class. Since you're passing, you're saying, I'm not changing anything from the parent class. So now you can instantiate your doggo classes through their subclasses 
which points to their breed. So now you can say Jack Russell Terrier, Miles, four years old, or Jack is a bulldog, he's called Jack, and he's three. Let's take a look at that in action. Here you've got your Dogo class loaded up. This will serve as the parent class. Note this code formatting. This is so that it fits in the window without going off the edge. If you have two F strings together, they will automatically concatenate. And the way you make sure that these are taken together is with the brackets. I'm just missing one here. So these just act like one string. Like this. But as you can see, you have to scroll off the right end of the screen. So this is equivalent. Anyway, say you wanted to make another type of class with slight variations. Let's just say with the name of the class for now. So we can say class Labrador. And using the brackets within that, we put in the parent class. Then we have the colon. And for now, all we want to do is change the name of the class, but keep everything else about the class the same. Control S to save, F5 to run, and that runs without any errors. So now we can create a dog called Gandhi, and we'll say he's a Labrador. His name is Gandhi, and he is an old dog at 13 years old. Note that you're just using the same constructor as the Dogo class for the Labrador class, because the Labrador class inherits from the Dogo class. And since it's not overriding or changing anything, we can just assume that everything within the Dogo class is now also within the Labrador class. So instantiating this is no problem. And then we can say Gandhi.name, Gandhi, Gandhi.age, 13. We can even look at the class attribute, Candice Familiaris. We can print Gandhi. Gandhi is 13 years old, as per the special Dunder method. And we can say Gandhi.speak. Boof. And Gandhi says boof. So there you are. That is the most basic form of inheritance. You can also check instances. So is instance, let's see, Gandhi is an instance of Labrador. We expect that to be true because it's the direct instance of that class. But you can also check if Gandhi is an instance of Dogo. And what do you expect to see here? It's true because a Labrador is an instance of a doggo because it's within that inheritance chain. And you could subclass Labrador again into, say, Labrador Retriever. And the Labrador Retriever would still be an instance of doggo because it shares that inheritance. That's an introduction to inheritance. You've seen how you can extend classes. That means having a parent class which you then subclass. Note that you may not need inheritance. Composition is easier to get your head around, and for a lot of cases, it's more flexible than inheritance. But there are some situations when you need slight variations where inheritance can be very useful. Just don't feel the need to use it everywhere. And that's inheritance. So you've inherited a class. But what about if you want to extend the parent class, and maybe you want to override or augment its methods? Instead of just making a copy with a different name, you want to make a copy and tweak just one little aspect of it. You can start with your parent or base class, Doggo. This is unchanged from the last lesson. And then instead of creating a new class with just a pass keyword, you can define a new method. And you'll note that you've got your speak method here, which takes self, sound, and returns 
name says sound. And this new subclass overrides the speak method. And it doesn't change it much, but what it does do is gives a default argument to the sound parameter. So now you can just say whatever the Jack Russell is, let's say it's miles, and you can say speak without any arguments, and the default behavior of this will be miles says arf, because of course, Jack Russell Terriers all go arf. That said, you can still use it like the original speak method where you pass in an argument, and then Miles will say whatever you pass in. So this is just a tiny tweak where you've added a default argument instead of an argument. And you haven't had to rewrite the whole class. You can just subclass it and override one method. And the way you override that is just by using the same name. In the original class, it's called the speak method. And in this class, it's called the speak method. So it overwrites it. Let's see that in action. So here you've got the class from the previous lesson. You've got your subclass. But say we want to change this slightly. And we want to change the way that speak works. What we can do is define another method here. And this will just completely overwrite what the original method does. So let's just say return hello for now, just to see this in action. So control S, F5 to make this run. Let's instantiate an object here. Let's go with Gandhi again. And he's 13. Now, instead of a normal doggo that just speaks the sound that you pass it in, if you ask Gandhi to speak, he'll say hello. But if you print Gandhi, he'll say Gandhi is 13 years old, like the base class. So all you've done here is just overwritten this method. So let's change that a bit. Sound equals boof. And we'll take this and just copy it. All we're doing is adding a default argument. And actually, let's make this a bit different. And let's make him say the sound twice. So it's just a slight variation. All the rest of the class will be the same. We're just overwriting this one method. So let's control S to save, F5 to run that again. We'll just copy the instantiation here. And if we'll say Gandhi.speak, we get that new message. Gandhi says boof boof. So that's extending a parent class. You can override methods from a parent class. All you need to do is subclass and then redefine the method by using the same name. All the other methods will work as before, including the constructor. It's like copying the class and overwriting just that one method.